Um, it's great to be here, and uh, I also want to welcome those of you who are in Durban or Port Elizabeth or uh, Cape, uh, Town's Cape Town's gone surfing. <laughs> okay, we'll see them in a moment. And we also just want to welcome you if you're joining us on the podcast, and we hope that you also really enjoy the presentation. For what you can't see is that there are around 25 people here and probably another audience of about 10, 15 elsewhere. Okay, what I want to do is look at the future, and in a sense, uh, we're living in it. All of us are futurists, whether we like it or not. I often say this, either we take hold of the future or the future takes hold of us. Either we see the future as something that you help your clients prepare for, which is a lot of what you do, or you see the future as something that you help your clients create. And it's my privilege to work with people who make history happen, and that's your privilege as well, and that's why I find uh, this space so interesting. Um, and. Uh, working with people who are inventing products and services for clients who don't even yet know they need them, for a space that doesn't yet exist. And uh, I want to look at uh, six key faces of the future, uh, just to help us to think about the future, in a, perhaps in a fresh way. And these six faces of the future spell the word future, F-U-T-U-R-E. And the first face of the future is to do, to do with the speed of change, and I don't need to talk to you guys about that one. Um, but the fact of the matter is that the consumers in South Africa and in every other country are quite capable of changing faster than you can organize a meeting with a client. Um, and uh, I'll give you an example of, of that in my own country, is my mother. Uh, my mother has sworn for years that she would never use a mobile phone and that the devil himself lived inside one. Okay. Now, she also said that she had heard from her friends that the internet was a dangerous place to buy stocks and shares. So you put these two things together, and she was telling her private banker, year after year after year, don't even think about talking to me about the internet or anything else like that. And so, of course, uh, they didn't prepare for her. Then one day, she phoned me up, and she said, Patrick, I have a crisis. And I went straight round, and I said, what on earth is the matter? And she said, I'm missing out on all my social life. The trouble is, uh, people are making their arrangements by SMS, by email, and then they post me a postcard. And by the time I get it, it's three weeks late. So I, I, I want you to help me. And so she asked me to go out with her shopping. And we came back with a, a, Windows, uh, a Windows XP professional. She wanted the best. She knew she wanted a broad computer, but she wasn't quite sure what broadband actually was. <laughs> uh, she knew she wanted a skipping computer because she knew that it was very cheap on phone, but didn't want, know what Skype was. And we came back with a webcam uh, with a wireless network running at 2 megabits per second and a 3G video phone. The following morning, I got a call from my mother saying, Patrick, Patrick, uh, the wonderful technology, I can send and receive emails, but I'm trying to phone my bank. They can't see me, and I certainly can't see them. And what had happened was my, my mother had jumped 40 years in four hours. And she had left all the market researchers in the dustbin. Why? Because how long will it take her bank to install video 3G enabled call center technology on every single desk of every relationship manager throughout the institution? What do you think? You, I mean, you're the people who advise banks on these kinds of things. What would you say? Several years. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how long will it take, in your view, how long does it take an average global bank to make a major technology decision at board level? Twelve months, right? by which time you've got the end of the cycle of, of the fact of the matter, the tender is out of date, the technology has moved on, and actually the project's the wrong one now. So we're, we're, we're dealing with this major challenge. And therefore, you and I have a fantastic opportunity, which is to help our clients visualize the future. We believe in market research, we just don't believe my mother. We believe in the products of market research, we get close to customers, we understand their world, we take their own views about tomorrow seriously, but we recognize they're as ignorant as anything about what tomorrow will actually be. And we then create a vision of what the future will be with your technologies, and then we try to imagine my mother inside it. And that is futuring, and there's no other way to do it. And the, but as I say, the challenge is that many, many things change faster than the board structures can even make the decision. Now, I spend a lot of my time looking at the center of the radar screen, ra uh, rather the outside edge of the radar screen. Most boards and senior teams focus on their operational strategy at the center. I spend my time looking at wildcards. 
Wildcards are tremendous exciting opportunities, unlikely events, unlikely technological combinations, which could just produce an amazing innovation, or they could pose a catastrophic risk. So wildcards could be the collapse of Mugabe's regime totally, followed by civil war, followed by contagion north, south, east and west. It could be. Maybe you say that's more than a 1% risk, Petri. Uh, wild cards could be uh, bird flu learning to spread very rapidly between human beings and affecting all kinds of markets and people's ability to get on a plane and travel to Joburg. A wild card uh, could be uh, all kinds of things. But one thing is clear. History tells us that uh, wild cards are driven by emotion, or rather the power of a wild card is usually connected to emotion, if you think about it. Let's imagine bird flu or SARS. Remember the SARS epidemic? How many people did it actually kill? 862. How many got infected? 8,600. How many billions of dollars did it wipe off the Southeast Asian economy? Loads. I was there at the time. Why? Because the future is not about a SARS virus or a bird flu virus. The future is about how people will react to it emotionally. It's a bit like some people blew themselves up on the underground railway system in my country in London. People said to me, are you going to move out? Are you going to leave the country? I said, what are you talking about? And what had happened was they had a huge emotional reaction to the deaths of 50 people on an underground system, which meant as far as they were concerned, living in Cape Town, life in London wasn't worth living. So that's why we don't believe market research. Market research, as I say, tells us the past. It tells us what clients used to think about the future. It bears no relationship to the longer-term reality. Now, we're, we live in a world of increasing time pressure. And one particular technology in Africa has increased that sense of time pressure. And I'll come to that. We live in a world uh, where 30% of your client's customers disappear if they have to wait more than 30 seconds for a web page. We also live in a world uh, where people press the lift button more than once. Okay, here's a confession time. You can, let's go and look at everybody else as well. Confession time. I want you to confess, if you, like me, sometimes, when you're very frustrated and you're in a hurry, if you are tempted, as I am, to press the lift button more than once to try to get it to come more quickly. Okay, put your hands up. I'm interested to know. Yeah, well, <laughs> now tell me this. Now, what is the logical basis of such an act? You are intelligent human beings. You are the creme de la creme. You invent these kinds of control systems. You know that it can't work. Listen, you could put in the greatest technology in the world and you find everyone behaving irrationally in the office. They're doing crazy things. Why? I don't know why. Just because human beings are human. So we need to really connect and understand with what people actually do. And I'll tell you one of the things people do, as you know, is they use SMS. SMS has been the killer technology in mobile telephony in all the emerging economies. Um, my, wife, uh, my wife left me in DRC and went home to look after our youngest son. I carried on through Uganda and arrived here. Last night I spoke to her. She said, we had friends from Uganda for dinner last night and I was astonished just right there in the meal. We texted another friend of ours who's in the remotest, remotest, remotest area where you would not even imagine there was a phone signal, let alone any power. And there they were, ding dong, ding dong, ding dong, throughout the meal, SMSing each other uh, with about a five second delay, always round. And I remember when I first visited this amazing, wonderful country. I remember when I was 18 years old and I came uh, to East London and I drove up the N2, as well, it was just a, a tiny road then, into Umtata. And I remember in those days, if a Land Rover fell off the vehicle and, and when you hit it in a massive ravine uh, and you had a hundred people waiting for you for a seminar, uh, in an hour's drive away, and the hundred people had walked two days to be there, they would wait. Why? Because there's no point in walking two days home, because they might be here any moment. Any half hour, they're going to be here, and two days later, they're still waiting. They can't get on with their lives, they can't do anything. And that was life, as it has been, up until very recently, really, the last five or six years, and before pervasive SMS. Now, of course, that kind of arrangement can be remade and made and made again, and we will be rescued by another big pickup truck and drag us out of that mess in no time at all. So we've moved from a situation where in many tribal cultures there has been very little word for time, apart from yesterday, tomorrow, and soon. Right? 
um, which is sort of now. Um, and, now we're, and, and now we're in a situation where people are measuring time in nanoseconds, uh, however poor they are, because they're still affected by the S SMS culture. Now, I want to talk about the great convergence-divergence debate. I know that you spend a lot of money selling goods on, based, and services based on the convergence story. But I want to suggest to you that convergence is about packaging economies of scale and the rest, but that all true innovation will be divergent in nature. And while we have this race to the bottom in terms of how many people we can pack, how many products and services and how many different facilities we can pack into a video camera or into a mobile phone, and a race to the, rather a race to the top on spec and to the bottom on price, and we see something else happening as well. Let's have a look. We see in the iPod story classic divergence. It's divergent on style. It does something small, smart, clear and clever and takes a massive lead. It's a very innovative product. So convergence wins for consumers, I suggest, when life is cheaper and better for them and simpler. But most people are divergent in their behavior. Let me explain. Put your hands up if you have many more facilities on your mobile phone than you will ever use. Right. So you're not great enthusiasts for convergence then. Uh, put your hands up if you have more than one remote control at, at home in your living room. Put your hands up. <laughs> Actually, can we just see Durban as well? I just uh, interested Durban. Uh, if you put your hands up, if you have more than one remote control in your living room, right? <laughs> now, listen. There are products on the market which cost five dollars or ten dollars, universal remotes, right? That's convergence, isn't it? Simpler and better. But is it? Why is it that you haven't gone out to buy one universal remote control? Tell me. I have, but I lost it in the video. Ah. <laughs> so you actually like divergence. That's the interesting thing. See, and low cost means you can be as divergent as you like and it still costs you nothing. And so we're actually innovating in a divergent world where the old last, uh, last century manufacturers are still on this treadmill of packing every single device they can think of into your mobile phone despite the fact that you don't know how to use most of the facilities on it. I mean, who really wants a web-enabled fridge? <laughs> Has anybody got one? I have. Well, actually, we've had a web-enabled waste bin for years. <laughs> I don't know why you're laughing. Actually, it's what every home needs. Just believe me. You see, what happens is you click and throw. As you click and throw a Coke can, courtesy of Tesco in London, the following morning, automatically, another one comes to your door. An intelligent disposal system, but actually most people like to shop and they don't like the thought of their fridge being constantly restocked as if they were in a hotel. So once again, we see Technology can go stark raving loony bonkers way ahead of where people are actually emotionally in their daily lives. Here we have a further confusion. One PC to do everything. In fact, I've got one in my case. It functions quite well as a TV. It's a digital thing. It's an absolutely massive giant of a machine. Uh, but actually, it's too big for some things and much too small for others. If we want to watch movies, we're using at home a screen three times this size, and even that's a little small these days. I mean, get real. With high digital TV, this kind of TV is not, uh, this kind of screen is totally inadequate for a home cinema. So we're stretching screen size to cope with this new digital stream coming at us at a billion miles an hour. At the same time, we're finding that most products, uh, you see, this one is too big or is it too small? I carry two PCs now. Why? Well, this one is quite handy for use on a plane because you could, uh, in a business class seat going across Europe, there's no room to even open up. My big one. If you don't believe me, I'll show you. See, this is my, this is my big one. Right? Now, I tell you, this is mighty handy. Oh, be quiet. <laughs> this machine is mighty handy on bumpy roads in the trans sky because anything else makes you completely sick. Doom, 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 doom. Because it's big enough. I can actually read the text on it while I'm moving around in the car. <laughs> now, although you're laughing, actually, I spend my life on the move, surfing the internet at three gig two gigabits per second on broadband. That is my office. Ten million individual people have been to my web pages. They're invented in cars, on trains, and on planes. It's very important to me whether I can do a web page on an airline seat or whether I can do it in a car. I know you still think I'm a bit mad. But actually, I've got another device. I've got, a, I've got a, a personal organizer in my pocket. You see, which is too small or is it too big? These companies are confused. We need to change the size of the image. The phone gets so small, it doesn't have a screen anymore. Has anybody got one of those yet? Okay, put your hands up if you've decided 
that your next PDA has got to have a larger screen than the current one because it's just too small to write on. Put your hands up. See, so while the telecom companies are going swerving down towards convergence and making it smaller and smaller, you're already saying, hey, get a life. Either give me a keyboard or give me a screen I can write on. Why? Because this device is now my total life. Um, and speech recognition will always be limited. So you can see these great dilemmas and confusion. When we put aside technology and we say the future is not about technology, it's about emotion, it's about individual people living their lives or trying to. The second phase of the future is urban, and it's to do with demographics and globalization. I'm not going to go through the, these other phases uh, as slowly as I went through the first one. But this, my friends, is the greatest opportunity in history. We have one billion children in Africa and Asia who will soon be consumers and will be entering the digital world. We have already three billion mobile phone subscribers. Now, I know that some people have more than one mobile phone, but the fact is that there are only four, four and a half billion adults in the entire world. There are only uh, around two billion actual households in the world, maybe less, maybe 1.5 billion, because most households in the world are quite large. Okay, you with me? So if we're saying there are already three billion active mobile phone accounts, and I tell you there's only half a billion people in the so-called affluent developed world, what does it tell us? What it tells us is that Nokia is about to reinvent itself as a telecom provider for people on low incomes in emerging economies. And I remember the day when a mobile phone was a fashion accessory and a luxury item, and something that people had on a business account. Uh, but now we're talking about mobile phones being a vital, vital link uh, for people who have no other technology in their house apart from a little radio set running on a battery for whom the whole business is driven on it, and as I say, the killer application is SMS. But we look, look at the impact of SMS and mobiles over the last five or six years, and we start to think forward. Think about the wave of the new computers coming out of MIT at $100 each, complete IT systems with hardware, software, web browsers, web processing, Excel spreadsheet, uh, antivirus uh, devices, and doesn't need any external power because you wind a battery. You wind it by hand. Uh, the screen automatically goes black and white in sunlight. Uh, it's a very clever device. If we could produce the whole of this box for $100 today, then it'll be $50 tomorrow. If it's $50 tomorrow, then that's a phone, a complete phone for five in the future. And we start to enter a whole new generation in terms of technology. Now, what I'd say is this, we're a long way from it. One of the greatest challenges is complexity. I know we made a bit of a joke about video conferencing, video, video conferencing systems that clunk and whir and crash and have to be rebooted. But let me ask another question. I want you to put your hands in the air. I'm doing a global survey now. Put your hands in the air if you have had significant difficulty in the last year in synchronizing your PDA with your computer. Put your hands up. <laughs> My friends, as I say, you are the global experts. If you can't do it, heaven help my mother. <laughs> and although you're laughing, I'm telling you, this is one of the biggest and most serious moral issues. It is an ethical issue. You would never, ever get away with selling, uh, with selling uh, four-wheel drive vehicles with such crappy reliability as we see in technology. Correct? Now tell me this, which inconveniences you most at the moment? The idea of a four-wheel vehicle breaking down on the way to work or being, or being in the middle of Hong Kong at three in the morning and having to spend 18 hours trying to solve your email problem. Put your hands up if actually it's the email thing which regularly hassles you more than a car breakdown. And the reason is the car breakdown, you can phone for a taxi. Someone else will get you out of the mess. You can abandon the car if, if, if it's crashed. Life will go on. But can life go on if you can't get your email when you're traveling? No. You're out of the game. And what is more, you've just lost a $3 million pre-contract agreement. Why? Because you look so, so amateurish to the client. You say, well, I'm sorry, I can't get my email. Yeah, but you, that was two days ago. I know, we've got a server problem. And so and what I'm saying is, Technology reliability in every respect, 
I'm not talking about the mega service now. I'm just talking about making it work for ordinary people. Make it work for you, for heaven's sake. And if it's not working for you, then it's not working for anyone. And if you want to know what the big issue is going to be in software development over the next five years, that is it. And if you can help your client to deliver systems which work every single time as reliably as the Toyota Land Cruiser that you use, then you'll find that they will start to beat the market and what's more, they can charge a premium price. And it's also to do with backup and things like that, which we'll come to. Now, urban thing is also about demographics, uh, 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 other issues as well, it's to do with health. And I'm afraid in this country and in this continent, I, I, it would be wrong of me not to put up at least one slide about this illness. As a physician, I've been fighting this illness since 1988. And I'm sad to tell you that the predictions I made in 1988 have been amply fulfilled right here in this country and in Uganda, Zimbabwe, in China. Russia has the fastest spread of this terrible virus of anywhere in the world in percentage terms. We are in the first week of this pandemic. It's a very new virus. We still have no cure, we have no vaccine, and we're a long way from both. And unfortunately, of your clients in, in South Africa, as you know, 20% at least of the people that you work with in the offices that you have your meetings with already have the virus, whether they know it or whether they don't. And, and if they've got a family of five, one of them is either dead or will be dying soon. They may not know that it was an age funeral they went to of a work colleague last week, but it probably was. So it's an absolutely mega issue. And yet the good news is that we can stop it. We know how to do this thing. We can kick AIDS out of Uganda. We are. And we can certainly kick it out of South Africa. We know exactly what to do. All people have to do is start talking about it, uh, using every means that we can. It's broadcasting. I was talking to SABC about that this morning. It's broadcasting, it's managers, it's human resource people, it's mothers, it's children, it's parents, it's youth workers, it's church leaders, everyone. And when that happens, this is what happens. Look at this in Uganda. We've seen the number of teenage girls with HIV fall from one in five by the time they leave high school, down to only 7%. That's great. You should be excited about that. Hello? You've gone very quiet. <laughs> but we can do it. It doesn't cost much. You know, it costs nothing to save a life. All you have to do is open your mouth. And when you mobilize whole communities to do that, um, and in the trans guy, we can have a, a full-time educator, because one-third of the country, this country, lives on $2 a day or less. Actually, in theory, in a third of the country, you can hire an HIV prevention worker for $2 a day. So it costs nothing to sort this problem out. It just requires a certain amount of will, and we can do it. Fast urban tribal. Tribalism is about the most powerful force in the world today. Tribalism is the most powerful positive and negative force. Every brand is a tribe. Every company forms tribes. Giorgio Armani is a tribe. Nike is a tribe. Every people group is a tribe. Every neighborhood is a tribe. Um, and, and yet, tribes also can bring trouble as we've seen in Rwanda, Burundi, Iraq. And we are seeing with growing contrast between tribes, between tribal groups in different parts of the world and inside them, we are seeing a recipe for instability in the future, which is growing. In fact, I'm convinced of this. I mean, see, I, I live this curious life. On Monday, I can be with uh, someone who's worth 8 billion euros in cash. That's what he's got, uh, you know, free. Um, and on Wednesday, I can be in the worst slum in Kolkata. It's a strange experience. And some of you have those kinds of experiences in the territories where you work. Um, and, uh, and one thing I'm convinced, unless we sort out some of these challenges, we will find new protest movements grow, which could make Al-Qaeda look rather trivial by comparison. Now, people need to belong. Tribalism is this powerful positive force. People need a sense of identity, of family. and. Uh, um, and that's where customer relationship management comes in, of course. The whole purpose of a CRM system is to build tribes. That's what it's there for. Um, and uh, here can I again make a plea. Who here is involved in teleconferences, uh, in, in call center software or systems? Or you've worked with a client recently who has call centers in them. Right. Put your hands up if you get really irritated when you get through to a telco company and they say, press one for accounts. Press two for service, press three for da da da, and you go through three or four layers, and eventually you get on hold and then you get cut off. Put your hands up if you find that really irritating. 
Okay. I find it so irritating, it makes me want to put the phone on the ground and put it in a bucket of water or stamp on it. Now, th the fact of the matter is, we object violently to it, don't we? Right? Why? Because the future is about technology? No, it's about emotion. And there's nothing more likely to, to increase the blood pressure for clients. Clients only phone your clients, their clients only phone your clients when they are in trouble. It's because they've been double billed. They stayed at a hotel and they see that there's a whole extra chunk of money disappeared from their account. Uh, they're worried about um, a, a smell of gas from their home and they can't get through. Whatever it is, they need help. They are already in trouble. And at that point, what they get is a robot. And I would suggest to you that one of the worst places to put technology is right there. For many people, their only experience of a telco company as a human being will be that support call. It's the same with computers. I go to PC World, come out with a computer. The only time I really understand the face of Toshiba is when I'm in trouble, right? And that's when I want someone from Toshiba to answer. I want someone to answer in my own language immediately and put me through quickly. And what's more, when I phone back, I don't want to go through switchboard again. Who here has been annoyed when they refused to give you their direct line or mobile number? You know, I remember once I had the experience this is, this is absolutely dreadful stuff. These are basic things which technology should be sorting out, and we've, we haven't even done it. Uh, I remember I had a problem with my computer, so I phone a call center. Eventually, I get through to someone who's half helpful, and she's working on the problem, and then, like a fool, I agreed to ring back. She said, oh, well, you know, we'll phone back in half an hour, and we'll have the answer. Half an hour later, I phone up again. I say, can I speak to Matilda Johnson? Oh, she doesn't work here. I said, excuse me, is this whatever the company is? No, 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 well, she might work in another call centre. I said, I'm sorry. <laughs> and then the penny dropped. I said, what country am I in? No, you're still in the UK, sir, but we have four call centres in the UK. I said, fine, can you switch a call between one call centre and another? Oh, no, we're not allowed to do that. That's against the rules. I said, can you at least tell me if this person works for you anywhere else? No, I can't do that because that would be a breach of confidentiality. I said... So what do I do? I said, well, it's very simple, sir. What you do is you, you go and ring in again. And every time you ring in, you say, um, is this the Norwich office or is it the London office? Or is it the Newcastle office or is it the Cambridge office? And after you phone them all and ask them all the same question, eventually you'll find someone who can put you through to your person you spoke to. <laughs> now, the other day I had another experience, which I hope you've had, which is I phoned straight back to a telco company I've been talking to before, after having gone through 15 layers of bureaucracy, and guess what? The call was answered directly by Thomas. He said, hello, I'm Thomas Jones. Oh, is that Patrick? Hi. Uh, you speak to Alex a little earlier. Sorry he's just out. He's only 10 minutes, but, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I can see the answer. Uh, yeah, we have found the power supply. The cable's gone out. Went out by FedEx this morning. Do you want the number? Oh, wow. And what happened, of course, is it recognised who I was coming in, switched me to the right desk. I was in the right team, and I was, ah, I'll tell you what, uh, that gave me a warm feeling inside. So once again, the message is, let's keep it simple, let's make it smart, let's be very careful about technology overkill, let's scrap the web-enabled fridges, let's take human beings out of call centres, let's put human beings back where they should be, and use technology where it can really make a difference. Fast, urban, tribal, universal. Universal, well, we'll go through this one fast enough. This is just the globalization story, which you're right in the middle of. But all I want to mention is the bottom of the pyramid, this extraordinary market of these 800 million adults who are on low incomes in India alone, and people like Hindustan Lever. Who here has heard of the Hindustan Lever bottom of the pyramid story? Some of you have. You know that Hindustan Lever has now, is now selling most of its shampoo in tiny sachets aimed at women on less than $3 a day who will buy one sachet to wash their hair every two weeks. And they make a higher margin on that shampoo than just about anything else they sell. It's responsible for most of their shampoo sales and is just a type of the future. And I would say watch out for that kind of story. In microbanking, microfinance, microloans, for instance, that's one idea. Now we're seeing microinsurance. So we're seeing a microinsurance product on a loan of $5. Health insurance on a $5 loan, for heaven's sake. Yes, it can be done, and it can be rolled out on a massive scale. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'll just skip through that. The RFID story, I think, is interesting. 
because nobody understands it. You understand it, I do, but nobody else does. Very few of your clients really get it. Radio frequency identification devices, wireless barcodes devices with software, hardware, but they're basically entire PCs the size of a grain of sand, as you know. Software, hardware, operating system. They don't need any power. They will last 100 years or more, maybe 200 years, we don't know. And Walmart alone needed 10 billion in the last 12 months. That was just tagging the big crates coming in. Metro in Germany is already tagging the individual cans of Coke and other products like that. And if, if Walmart starts doing that, you'll be talking about <laughs> trillions of these kinds of devices entering the environment every 12 months. That means if I have an RFID scanner, I would expect to see, coming up here, uh, maybe in this room right now, I'd expect to see maybe 1,000, 1,500, 6,000, 1,200, 1,400 devices all talking to me right now. I know who they all are, unless you've encrypted them. And I can see, sir, where you bought your belt, and the prescription of your glasses, and where your shoes were made. And at that point, remember the future is not about technology, it's about emotion, and you're starting to react, just like people started to react against Benetton. Benetton saw a massive boycott of all of its products because they started to label some of their trousers with RFID technology in the United States. The same thing happened to poor old Gillette. The reason why Gillette tagged its razor blades is because Maxi razor blades are some of the priciest products in the market. A box of them is worth more than ten to twenty thousand dollars. And did you know that one in ten of all Max 3 razor blades worldwide are stolen? Uh, but yet, my customers, my clients, in the last 12 months, since introducing the RFID, have seen theft fall by about 70%. It's a fantastic invention, RFID. It's the solution we've been waiting for for years and years. Those of us have been fiddling around with SAP systems and goodness knows what else to try and track inventory. The problem was always getting the data into the system. Now we know. It means that someone in China who makes steel can actually watch tins of Coca-Cola in a steel can go out of a Walmart store in Toronto and guess what the demand will be. They don't have to guess. It's all wired up and just happens. So it gives quite a, a, quite a big leap and it doesn't stop there. This is brain tissue, human brain tissue, uh, growing onto the surface of a chip and chips our brain cells, your brain cells, are programmed to talk to chips. We don't need to teach them how to do it. Uh, here is a chip. You can see with those six uh, uh, round blocks sticking up. And those are to catch brain cells. You fill a glass of water with brain cells and put the chip in it and stir it up. Okay? You pull the chip out and look at it under the microscope and you will find that a few of the brain cells have got caught in these cavities. And brain cells are very active and curious. They don't like to be alone. They're community animals, so the first thing they do is they put out a few branches or two just to see what's there. And if they find a connection with another one, they put out another thing, and another wire, and another wire, until you've got broadband. It's all about bandwidth. <laughs> it's true. That is how your brain works. The more activity there is in a particular area, the greater the bandwidth that gets built. And so you can see what's happening with this grid here, and you can see that these brain cells are in a very early stage of starting to generally organize themselves. And you can see some bandwidth starting to form there. So there's obviously some active communication going on up there. Um, fascinating. So we have the capacity already to send a virtual Valentine's Day card from you to someone else the other side of the world using a combination of RFID and SMS type technology. We're already doing it in Mice and Rats. They are already feeding each other, rewarding each other, and communicating feelings for each other virtually. And once again, you're saying, oh my. Because the future is about emotion, it's not about technology. We, then we need a reality check. We just say, who's going, to invent, who's going to take this stuff? A woman came up to me this morning. She said, I have to talk to you. I heard all, my, my, my daughter was in this session yesterday at the SABC conference. She wants to know, you're a futurist. Have you got a biodigital brain? <laughs> I said, uh, no. She said, that's very disappointing. I'm very disappointed. I said, well, my wife, who I've known as my best friend since I was 16, said I fell in love with a biological man and I want to carry on living with one without the digital. Thank you very much. So, uh, emotion.
Fast urban tribal universal radical. Radical is about single issue activism and the death of politics. And the fact is that the passion in politics today is not about left or right or capitalism or socialism. Politics is about single issues. It might be human cloning. It might be black empowerment. It could be uh, uh, genetically modified food. It could be global warming. Whatever it is, single issues are where you will find passion. And that's why um, companies are taking single issues so seriously. Because you can walk into Nigeria, believe me, you can walk into the UK, you can have a discussion about energy policy in the country and come away with a verbal understanding with the head of government and it's worth nothing. Why? Even a written agreement is worth very little because if something changes in the world, if SABC gets hold of the story, if CNN starts driving on it, if Greenpeace gets hold of it, then you believe me, before very long, the government will start to legislate and your company will have to change policy and your clients will change policy. Because every single issue tends to lead to regulation and regulation affects business. It creates opportunities and closes down others. Now, of course, if you were to say, what is the biggest single issue, Patrick, that's going to hit us over the next two decades, it has to be the issue of sustainability. And I mean that widely. I'm not just talking about environment, I'm talking about personal sustainability. I'm talking about family sustainability. I'm talking about emotional sustainability. I'm talking about political sustainability. It's more than just uh, a, a biological thing about diversity of species or how much rainfall there will be in South Africa in the next decade. Now, this graph shows some science. I think the science is sound. I've looked at the Antarctic records of, uh, of carbon dioxide and temperature, which is a complicated function of the isotopes of hydrogen, which you can correlate with ice ages. And it goes back 750,000 years, this data. And I've looked at it closely. I'm utterly convinced that we are experiencing man-made, woman-made global warming on a significant scale, and it requires a major response. But even if you don't agree with me, it's irrelevant. I said the future is not about science, it's not about grass, it's about emotion. And the fact is that there's a huge emotional connection in the public worldwide with this issue. And that is going to drive some of the biggest business opportunities your clients have ever seen in history. Why? Because it's just about everything to do with energy. I'll just give you one example. Now, this computer is working on solar power right now. Um, and I flew here on water power. I flew to Joburg on water power. And it cost me ten dollars. It cost me $20 extra to convert to a water power ticket. Of course, I'm talking about offsets. I'm talking about investing. My company, working out how much carbon I would use and how much my carbon my wife would use with cooking or us with our washing up machine, how much carbon I'd use uh, with the wax to, making the wax to polish my shoes, my total carbon use. And then putting all of that money uh, to offset that into a hydroelectric plant in some developing country, maybe on a very small river, which doesn't make any sense economically whatsoever. Because it needs a 30% subsidy to work. So we put $2,000 in there or something towards that. It becomes economically viable. Someone like Siemens is very happy at having yet another hydroelectric contract. The community are very happy to go water powered. They stop using all their carbon, and I claim a carbon credit, which I can offset against my travel. And this is an absolutely vast business for the future. You're going to see water-powered airlines. HSBC is the world's first solar-powered bank. Um, you're going to see banks go solar-powered. Uh, I mean, why couldn't you? Uh, why, you, could, you, you, you? Dimension data, you could decide to become the world's first uh, totally... Uh, energy neutral uh, IT company. Why not? It costs nothing. I mean, it costs you something like five rand or something to uh, make sure that all the equipment in this room w uh, is, is completely carbon neutral for three years. I mean, it really doesn't cost much. Uh, what I'm saying is you're going to see an explosion of all kinds of creative schemes to save energy, trade energy, and do just about anything with it and every one of your clients will be involved. Now, why is it important with IT? Let me tell you why. Did you know that more than 10% of the entire energy consumption of the world's most energy-greedy country 
is PCs. 10% at least, it's sometimes I think it's 15%, depending on the time of year, of the entire output of all the new power stations in America is simply driving screens, inefficient uh, chips, and just about everything else. Um, the new plasma screens, these are ridiculously unfriendly environmentally. If you convert, the, if you look at the energy cost from an ordinary TV, a vacuum last century, 19th century valve, to one of these things, there's no comparison. The amount of heat generated off the back, that's why these things are so thick. It's red hot behind here. And you know, you know these boomer plasma screens. These are big, big issues. Watch out for them. Fast, I must finish with this. Fast, urban, tribal, universal, radical, how do we live in this crazy world? It's so fast we can hardly think at times. It goes faster than our clients can arrange a meeting with us. Uh, so urban with its profound social and demographic challenges. So tribal that sometimes we fear that our world could fall to pieces. So universal that sometimes we feel swamped and we're going to lose our identities totally. So radical that it seems small numbers of people can gain huge power. Well, we need ethics and values, and this is the most important face of the future. We've been touching on it all the way through. Ethics is what actually connects with the passions that are deep inside you. It's why you get out of bed in the morning. It's how you feel you make a difference. It's about all the things that are the most important things in your life. And I just want to say, those of you who are developing strategy with companies, take note. You can develop the best strategy in the world for a company, but nothing will change, I believe me. You could, they can spend half a million dollars or a billion dollars on change management programs with you, with McKinsey or anyone else, and I promise you, very little will happen. Unless they sack everyone and get a whole load of new people in, it'll be very, very difficult. Why does nothing happen? I'll tell you why. Because if they don't see the point, why will they change? And I'll tell you this too, and I've seen this over and over again in the NGO, non-profit sector, in the aid sector, which is half of my life, and the humanitarian side, you don't need change management programs. People change. They make it happen. Why? Because they get it. We can't stop new countries from starting up operations. I had a phone call the other day from Croatia. We were sitting down to dinner in our house near London Airport, the Heathrow Airport. My, phone, my, my, my wife takes a phone call. She says, it's Katerina here from Heathrow Airport. She says she's from Asik, Croatia. I said, we don't have any program in Croatia. She must be mistaken. No, well, she wants to speak to you. I, she, I said, hello, she says, I, Katerina, I Heathrow Airport. I come see you now. I said, excuse me, I, don't, I have no idea who you are. It's lovely to speak to you. It's, it's about 8 o'clock in the evening. I said, it's lovely to speak to you. No, no, she said, you understand nothing, she said. I, Asset Croatia, I director, I national director of Asset Croatia. She said, I friend of Milan and Thomas. Milan runs Asset Slovakia, <laughs> Thomas runs Asset Czech. And I said, OK, now I understand. Come. Why? She didn't need a change management program. She didn't need an, an, um, a, an innovation strategy. What had happened was she had met some friends, got hold of a vision of kicking AIDS out of her country, and decided to get on and do it without being paid a penny. Now, what I'm saying is, when you get passion, you'd, uh, things happen. And when you don't have any passion, nothing can happen. Um, you know, I've been doing a survey of, uh, of companies because I, I often follow CEOs. You see, the CEO gives, stands up and gives a speech about uh, the last quarter's profits and the bottom line and the return on equity and the Excel spreadsheet numbers. Please, can I put it on the regions? Because I'll see in the regions. Anyway. The bottom, the bottom right-hand corner, the 10 <laughs> <laughs> Oh, dear. I'm going to get into real trouble now. But, but let me tell you, I'm trying to do this global survey, OK? I'm, I'm trying to write a book. The book is entitled, People Who Get Out of Bed to Make Shareholder Value and Bottom Line Profit. I've had one nomination for study in the last five years. I'm going to have to change the title to the title of, about the people who can't be found. You see, <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been looking. And it's one thing, you know, if you've got a family-owned company, then I admit it, you know, and then it then goes public. It's all very personal. If the company goes bust, it's like losing a baby. And I, I'm one of my first companies, the first company I started, eventually stopped trading. I felt a kind of grief reaction. Yes, okay, but if it isn't that, 
You know, most CEOs of publicly listed companies, what happens to them if they don't make their numbers for two consecutive quarters? Gone, right? So how can you expect such a CEO to have a profound emotional attachment to this publicly listed organization? You can't. And any CEO who pretends that they do, well, <laughs> quite clearly, quite clearly there has to be more to life, doesn't there? Because you could be out through no fault of your own. Something changes in the market. The analysts don't like your last report. So, um, so if people don't get out of bed to make shareholder value and bottom line profit, then why on earth do we go on and on and on and on and on and on and on about it? As if the thought that the more we talk about bottom line profit and return on equity, the more we'll make. I would suggest to you that the fastest way to destroy shareholder value is to be so obsessed with it that we lose sight of why we exist. And why do we exist? To make money, to return on to shareholder value and bottom line profit. Maybe I want to suggest to you that your company exists because of a promise. Who here is involved in sales? In any kind of outward facing role, sales to clients. Right. Uh, sorry, what's your name? Huh? Saki. 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 Saki knows when he. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. I'm sorry. For those of you who are watching this at home, there is an anatomical situation with his face, but I won't uh, <laughs> explain it. Okay. Listen. I wasn't meaning to be personal. <laughs> Saki is aware. <laughs> Saki is aware. I have one too, you see. It takes one to see. Okay, Saki is aware. Every time you go into a client, Saki, your reputation is on the line. Isn't that right? Because you go in there and you say, Dimension Data, we're here to help you. I've, I, wa I want you to know I've been thinking about your problem all night. I've been talking with some friends. We video conferenced to Cape Town and Durban this morning. I'm not saying we've got the whole answer, but we're beginning to find a way to find a way forward on this, right? Because that awful company that sorted out those systems that didn't sort themselves out, we need to refix that. Okay? And this is my promise to you. I think we're the best company in Joburg to sort this out. I think we're the best company in South Africa. And we've got a fantastic team. But the most important thing is we're passionate about sorting this out. Right? And you win the deal. Now, if SOC is any good, that's at the point you really start to worry. And you come back to the office and say, I think I've just oversold. Because I'm... <laughs> <laughs> I said, and I believed it at the time, that we could sort it out in eight weeks. But actually, having had another sleep this night, I'm really thinking it could take us three months. And if it is three months, they'll be out of business. And my friend will lose his job. And so will a whole load of other people. We're going to have to really pull together on this one. Now, I want to suggest to you that every product and service is, is sold on the basis of a promise, right? It's a promise of what? A better life. We will sort things out so life goes better for you, right? And for your customers and your customers' customers. Therefore, I want to suggest to you that the reason why Saka gets out of bed in the morning, I hope it is, is not because of some share option that's enticing you to stay, but because actually you had a a real concern about that client. You really want to deliver for them on time, and the first thing you did in the morning is you phoned them up to do a rain check, you've got another meeting, making sure it's all, on, uh, 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 you know what I'm saying. And your purpose is to deliver on your promise. It's a moral issue. You sold on the basis of a promise, they've signed, they've already paid over some huge amount of rounds because they actually trusted you to deliver. You started work, and you are now under a moral pressure to deliver on the promise. Agreed? That's your purpose. And you know what? If you could actually deliver on the promise, if you are one of the only IT companies in the entire world to consistently deliver on budget and time, people will come thundering to your door. I know that because I speak to hundreds and hundreds of CIOs and CTOs every year and they always complain the same. They will come thundering to your door and what's more, when you put in for your next price on your next project, you can load a big premium on. And the reason why they will come to you and they will buy it is because at board level, when it's about to be booted out because you're 30% more expensive than your nearest competitors, the chairman of the board says, well, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to risk my entire future on a shoddy cut price contract that may not deliver.
and, the, and Sharky has delivered every single time. I trust him totally. I don't think Sorry. he's going to... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I changed your name a bit. <laughs> but that's, that's a fact, isn't it? Isn't that, don't you believe that's what your business is being built on? Isn't that right? And that, my friends, is the key to shareholder value and bottom line profit. In an age where most people are too far away from the customer to really understand what it's all about. And everywhere I go, and it doesn't matter whether it's on the streets of Soweto, on the most luxurious parts of Zurich, in the worst slums of Kolkata, or in the most fabulous suburbs of Cape Town, I find the same. People talk to me, yes, they talk about personal happiness, they talk about fulfillment, the challenge of a job, how it's nice to be appreciated, to be part of a great team, to pull together, to have fun. Yes, all of those things, but that's not enough for passion. They also talk to me about work-life balance, they talk to me about their family, their friends, their children, their aged mother who's sick and the reason why they might have to go back to another country or whatever it is. They talk to me about their communities in which they live and they talk to me about the wider world. Uh, I've been doing a global survey uh, of another kind, perhaps we could go to Durban as well. I want you to put your hands in the air if in a moment, if in the last, if in the last uh, couple of years you've given time, wait for it first before you react, if you've given time for something for nothing, not because it was a member of your family or a friend or a good colleague at work, but it was just something you felt you had to do. Let me give you an example. It might be that you shook a tin for the tsunami disaster for the Red Cross. It could be that you work as a volunteer at your children's school. It might be that you do the accounts of a small uh, AIDS orphan project in the, trans, in the old trans guy. It might be that you simply uh, walk uh, uh, to do the shopping for an old lady who broke her hip at the end of your road. You don't even know her surname, but you know that she's sick. Uh, uh, whatever it is, it might be you're part of a church as I am, or a synagogue or a mosque, whatever it is, if you have given time to something that you actually feel quite strongly about, you just felt you had to do it. You weren't actually paid to do it here. Put your hands up now. And you see passion. You see passion in Derb, and you see passion wherever we look. And those of you who didn't put your hands up, I apologize. You see, some of you are too busy right now, so you outsourced it instead. And you gave a donation to the tsunami disaster. You just didn't have the time to give. And why do you give time, my friends? You give it because you're interested in community. That's what it's about. And it's more than that. There's passion for people's own needs, passion for family and friends, passion for community, but there's a wider passion too. Put your hands in the air if you've had a strong conversation about the war in Iraq and American foreign policy and what they should do about Iran or something like that in the last year. Put your hands up. Keep your hands up if you have a personal friend or relative in Iraq or Iran. Okay, now apart from you, it's nothing to do with the rest of us. And yet we watch a CABC broadcast and we all become armchair presidents of the world. <laughs> and you know what? and I've got four minutes before this tape runs out, and I'm nearly done. You know what? The extraordinary thing is, this is passion. It's a passion for our wider world. We feel genetically programmed or otherwise. We just feel that we're part of this wider community. My friends, if you remember nothing else, remember this. In every one of your clients where you install an IT system, you find the same passions. You find them in all the shareholders that own your shares. You find them in the people who read the papers and watch the SABC programs. You find them in your parents and your children, in your friends and your neighbours. They are universal things. And when you tap into these kinds of passions, what are they for? They're for one slogan, and this is the fundamental slogan that should drive all IT innovation. It's passion to make life better. It's passion for a better future. Whether it's for your neighbours, your family, for yourself, for the people in Iraq, uh, for uh, some uh, near extinct uh, elephants in some uh, threatened jungle or whatever it is. And that is the driving ethic which will drive every business for the future. And you can see the future in two ways, and with this I finish. Fast urban tribal, universal, radical, ethical world, you can see it in two ways. You can see it as a fast urban, universal world, which is the world of most of your clans. Technology, globalization, demographics and lifestyles. Or you can move the cube just through 180 degrees and you see a very different picture. You see a world that's very radical, very ethical, and very tribal. And my question to the CEOs of some of the largest companies in the world has been this. How many people would it take, if you are the chairman of IBM, 
or BP or ExxonMobil or Credit Suisse? How many people would it take in your world, your shareholders, your workers, to be very tribal in their, in, in, or organized, tight, organized, very radical in their thinking, and very ethically motivated? And remember, Al-Qaeda has ethics. You might not like them, but they have ethics. You might not think they're moral ethics, but they are ethics. Okay, how many people need to be very radical, very ethical, very tribal in a town or a city or a nation to totally change the business model of one of your clans? Do you know what these CEOs answer? It's always the same. 0.5 to 2%, they say, of their shareholders, workers, things like that, would need to be very radical in their thinking, very ethically motivated, very tribal, tight, together, well organized, to totally transform a country. And you see those forces in operation at the moment in obvious ways in places like Saudi, in Afghanistan, but you also see them in South Africa, you see them in Cape Town, you see them in East London, you see them here in Dimension Data, you see them in every organization, in every part of our society. So what's the lesson? The lesson, my friends, is this. The cube is weighted. For you, it keeps coming up fast. Technology, speed of change. Often it comes up universal, and quite often urban, demographics, lifestyles, fashions, fads. But every now and then, it may just twist and turn and come up with a tribal face. It may just come up with a radical issue. It may just come up with a major ethical question. And you will find that these particular faces, therefore, also need to be watched. So take hold of the future, or the future will take hold of you. This is a time for innovation, invention, but let's put people right at the center of the technologies we create. Let's always remember why we are here, which is for a better world, and just keep turning the cube. Thank you very much. Thank you.